So yes, I'm Ruth, um, and I'm here to talk to you about archaeology, the Romans, and the national curriculum. I'm currently a specialist teacher in history and English at UCS Junior Branch, which is an independent school for boys aged 7 to 11. Before that, I taught in state primary schools in South London as a class teacher, so I taught the whole curriculum. And before that, I was a senior archaeologist at MOLA. So for the last seven years or so, I've taught the Romans in some form in both the state and independent sector. So when I start teaching the Romans, I always want to know what the children already know. Um, I get these draw pictures, because sometimes they struggle with terminology. So this is my current class of year five, they're nine and ten, and before I've even started teaching them, this is what they know from popular culture. So from horrible histories, from books they've read, from underage watching a gladiator at home. Um, so you've got the uh, Roman Sonia, we've got togas, laurel reeds, we've got gladiators, and we have Boudicca with some very dubious spelling. Um, what's really interesting is that all of these things that we already know from popular culture are the themes that teachers are su is suggested that teachers cover in the national curriculum. So in the key stage two national curriculum for children aged seven to eleven, the children this is for England, um, teachers have to teach the Roman Empire and its impact on Britain. Now the document gives a few suggestions for what else they could teach. So invasion power of the army, conquest, British resistance, and the Romanization of Britain. Um, and in my experience, these are all things that the children already know about from popular culture. What's also really interesting is that the national curriculum does not mention archaeology. Yes, a couple of sites are mentioned, Care went to Patreon's Wall, but archaeology as a discipline is not mentioned. Um, which is ridiculous, because with the new, I say new, 2014, published 2013 curriculum, we have prehistory, we have ancient civilizations, we have early medieval England or Britain. How can we teach that without archaeology? Um, interesting as well, the Department for Education also wants children, in their study of history, to develop these skills. The ability to ask perceptive questions, to think critically, to weigh evidence, to sift arguments, develop perspectives and judgment to look at change through time, the diversity of societies and the relationships between different groups, as well as reflecting on their own identity. Of course, archaeology is key for that too. So, I, in my lessons, used archaeology to move beyond the popular cultural stereotype of white male soldier, which every child seems to go for, um, and to really challenge children's thinking. So I thought it would be beneficial just to show you a few examples of, well, how I teach history. So I like to use a mystery model. So I start with an object, and I ask the children questions, or they ask me questions about it. Um, this is one of my favourite objects to use. It's not, it's not from here. It's from the bars of Diocletian in Rome, but it is a slave collar. And the inscription reads, I have bled, take me to my master Zoninus, and you will earn a gold coin. The children do know, not know what it is. They guess. Every, every time I do it, somebody says it's a dog collar. Multiple children say it's a dog collar. And then they're surprised and horrified when they realise it's a slave collar. And this leads to really interesting discussions. I just taught it last week. Um, and it led to a class discussion on the history of slavery through time to its abolition in the 19th century in Britain, um, but also um, the legacy of slavery and how institutions are now reflecting and acknowledging the contributions that money from slave slavery um, has had an impact on them even now. Um, but also, we look at modern slavery. The children in the news see court cases where, you know, people trafficking, so we, in an age-appropriate way, we, we cover all sorts of aspects like that. Um, other successful images I've used, um, this one here, it's a rag doll, this is from the British Museum. Um, this one's great because it really helps the children reflect on their previous learning. So this one's actually from Roman Egypt. The previous year, the children have studied ancient Egypt and they're able through questions to help to sort of 
concentrate, focus their thinking. They're able to, many of them, make the link with ancient Egypt to find the materials used. used. So they think linen, oh, mummies, it looks a bit like a mummy, and it helps build their chronological understanding. And of course, they the land of tablet 291, which is the Claudia Severa Berkeley invitation, which is the example of, well, one of the earliest examples of female handwriting in Latin, leads to whole class discussions on the role of women in Roman society, female literacy, um, and also sexism. And when I construct a I often start with an object as the hook, but then I use resources from elsewhere online to help to build my lesson before we do the independent activities. So these two Roman voices is great for that. So this is just an example about how I might construct a whole lesson based around an artifact. So this is a cursed tablet from Roman Bath. I flipped the mystery model here. This time, the children have asked the questions of me about the artifact, and we think about the answers together. Once we've reflected on the artifact and identify what it is, for example, they then, because I'm a teacher of English as well, we I like some creativity into it too, so they write their own, often rather gruesome curse, and then they use the cursive script to create their own artifact too. This activity, incidentally, was originally produced by the Roman Bards Museum. I've adapted it. They produced it for secondary schools, but it's really, really relevant for younger children too. Also, as an English teacher, we use a lot of historical fiction, so I we nip over to Pompeii. Um, and I use this portrait, supposedly of Church's new and unnamed woman, um, as a stimulus. Um, they ask questions, you know, imagine, you know, ask questions of, of these people, you know, if they went back in time, if they asked them, and, you know, did you die, <laughs> etc. Et um, I like, again, that the woman is holding a stylus, although she's unnamed and the children have to give her a name, um, it does show that she's literate and maybe she had some involvement in the business. There's a really great animation, um, which is by Zero One Animation and Melbourne Museum for a Pompeii exhibition they had a few years ago, which is an immersive CGI reconstruction of the eruption, which really helps the children to structure their writing. And the writing I get out of them, it's just so evocative, it's so powerful, and it's, it's really quite, well, some, some of them are very sad because obviously their characters die. Um, so, you can see there that I don't really use worksheets. I personally think, you know, sometimes they're not particularly educationally valuable. I have a much more creative style of teaching. Um, in general, teachers who are trying to teach history, um, we need open-ended stimuli, multimedia, to promote discussion as a class and then that lead on to creative cross-curricular activities. Resources needs to be accessible by an interactive whiteboard or projector. So like I'm doing here, you might have children on the carpet or at their desks sort of discussing ideas, for example. Um, easy to follow resources, easy to follow instructions and giving answers to some of the questions children are like to ask. Resources need to be mindful of children with English as an additional language, so with glossary and terminology explained, and special educational needs and disabilities. When I teach a child who has a hearing impairment, it's quite hard sometimes to find good quality clips with subtitles. Um, and resources should be inclusive and representative and have longevity. And I'm going to be focusing on the last two here when I look at some resources currently produced by the heritage sector, so museums and heritage organisations, um, archaeology units, for example, when I, when I look at them together now. So, Building on actually what Caroline said, and actually, yes, and what Howard said too, capturing the diversity of Roman Britain is really, really key for me. And it is tricky to do because some of the resources that Caroline was talking about, so the, um, the Harper and the Land Street um, bodies, the resources online, they're hard for, they would be impossible, I'd say, for a um, non specialist teacher to teach using them. I have to explain a lot of the concepts to the children that I teach. Whereas this image here, this English heritage, it was actually produced for their members magazine. It's not even in their sort of school section. It's great. It's really simple. 
but it shows all echelons of society. It's got wealthy people, it's got poor people, it's got men, women, children, it's got people of colour. You know, a child sitting on the carpet, perhaps this is suitable for younger children, so year three, age seven and eight, sitting on the carpet with their teacher. They love the where's Wally kind of aspect, looking at all the little details. This is for such a simple resource, it's incredibly powerful, okay? When our teachers are looking for objects to talk about, this is a great resource, teaching history of 100 objects at the British Museum. It's got great teaching ideas, step by step, takes teachers through, it's got links from other websites for the classroom. Problem is though, many of the links are now broken. Okay, so this leads me on to the longevity of resources and the functionality of them. This new resource, um, London with Graham, it's great. It's for tablets and iPads and phones. Great for independent work. Children can click on things. They love it. It's really tactile. The problem is, it's made for iPods and tablets and phones. And many state schools will not have those or have one set for 12 classes. When I put it on my interactive whiteboard, please rotate device. <laughs> it's stuck to the wall. Okay. Or if I put it on my laptop, I have to just decrease the size of the screen. So it's a resource that's brilliant, but it could have far greater reach. And sadly, the much missed Street Museum Londinium, no longer functional or available. We used to love this, okay? Uh, so, thoughts for the breach future. In theory, online resources produced by the heritage sector, museums, archaeological units, have the potential to be incredibly inclusive. Not every child can visit a museum or a monument. Not every child can receive an outreach visit from their local museum or heritage organisation. State schools cannot afford to update the outdated paper resources they've been collecting on the Romans since the late 1980s when the National Curriculum was brought in. However, every state primary school in England has some form of interactive whiteboard or data projector. There are 4.7 million children currently in state-maintained primary schools who can engage in our country's heritage in their classroom you know, learning about recent archaeological discoveries or recent reinterpretation of existing museum collections if such resources existed for the Romans. That's 4.7 million children who could learn about archaeology, who could be inspired, like I was, age seven, to be an archaeologist. My generation of archaeologists are time team. There's no such equivalent for the children of today. I'm going to presume that if you're here, you have more than a passing interest in the future of Roman archaeology and the future of museums and the future availability of university courses and the viability of commercial archaeology. So this is a plea on behalf of, particularly on behalf of my colleagues in the state sector. I know that heritage organisations like state schools are under tremendous financial pressure. I know that often museums are reliant on the goodwill of volunteers, but please work smart. Museums, if you happen to be giving your Roman gallery interpretation a refresh, consider whether it's possible to create simple digital resources which can be viewed both in the gallery and online. Make your websites easy to navigate as possible. Learning resources can be tricky to find. And check links regularly too. Commercial archaeology units. I know the results of excavations need to be disseminated to specialists via grey literature, but schools would benefit so much from popular online resources designed for a more general audience. Don't feel you have to create some specifically for children. Children don't like to be patronised. And one seventh of the adult population have the literacy levels of a nine to 11 year old anyway. Okay? The public at large would benefit from engaging presentations that are, you know, resources that are engaging and carefully explained. Okay? So, Thanks to the National Curriculum, despite archaeology not even being mentioned in it, the heritage sector has a captive audience of 4.7 million primary school children. As Caroline said, these children are our future archaeologists, future curators, future academics, and future planning policy makers. This is your opportunity to engage them, to challenge their thinking, and to inspire them. Thank you.